Okay, all good recording. Yep. <clears throat> so uh, today we will have a look at uh, error handling in Rust. Um, to have a quick overview, uh, we will look at unrecoverable errors uh, for a little bit of time. Although that's not as interesting as recoverable errors, which is the next topic. And then we will do a few slides mixed with code examples of using result, using the question mark operator, and using anyhow for uh, basically adding some more power to the result type. Uh, so that's optional, of course, to uh, learn about it, I would say. But uh, I'm going to include it because I think it's a very good resource to have in your tool belt when working with Rust. And it's uh, quite popular to use. Um, so let's start with unrecoverable errors. Uh, do you guys, uh, first let's uh, take one minute to uh, write something in chat. Uh, if you have any ideas for examples, you can write them in the chat right now. Yeah, actually, that was a mistake. But... If you can think of anything that's, uh, that you cannot recover from, um, just write it in the chat or say it on the microphone. Yep, so we have two examples. So infinite loop uh, technically will never crash your program uh, unless you somehow end up filling up the stack or your memory inside of that loop. So it can cause an unrecoverable error, but if it's just an empty loop, it won't uh, necessarily crash anything. But uh, depending on what you do in the loop, then an infinite loop can definitely uh, mess up your program. And uh, the other one, moving a string to another and then using both. Um, uh, the compiler will actually catch this at compile time. So uh, in theory, at least in Rust, this should never get to uh, never be compiled and crash. But if you're using, for example, C or C++ and you do uh, do the move and then try to use them, this could, uh, could cause a, a crash. So yeah. And then we also have uh, reading out of bounds of an array or a vector. So if you index element 10, but there are only eight elements, um, that's basically a crash. Um, if you access an invalid memory address or a protected memory address, so basically when you read out of bounds, this is kind of the same. Although uh, these kind of errors are definitely more prevalent in other languages. So um, and then we have divide by zero is a classic one. Um, usually there's no way back from that as far as I'm aware. Uh, unless of course you create your own function that protects from this or you have some sort of operator that protects against this and returns the result type instead for division. Um, yeah, so those are some examples. Uh, and then we have uh, what they are. So uh, in Rust, a un un unrecoverable error is a, uh, signaled by a panic. Uh, and a panic is basically what, uh, uh, what you would do when the program totally crashes and there's no way out. So this is triggered in the case of an unrecoverable error, or if you uh, have a result that you don't manage, uh, this can, and you assume that it is the success type, this can trigger a panic, even though you technically could have handled the error. And if you if we take this in, a, in the context of a result type, uh, you have some utility methods unwrap and expect that we will look at some examples for, of. But basically, unwrap uh, takes a result type that can be either, indicate either success or failure. And unwraps it so you basically open it up and if it's a success you take the value or if, or if it's an error you crash the program you basically panic but uh, usually anything that's caused by unwrap or expect in terms of unrecoverable errors uh, are in theory recoverable so 
it's sort of an A side to how you can uh, willingly crash your program in case uh, in the case where you actually want to do it. And in the context of your program, this would be unrecoverable because sometimes uh, being unrecoverable is uh, depends on the program as well. But uh, oftentimes like an unrecoverable error can be caused, it's probably caused by the programmer or if you have an invalid invariant. For example, in division, you should divide by zero. And if you sort of, uh, if you do so, then you invalidate that uh, division should not be uh, divided, divide, uh, like you should not divide by zero. And then you get the get a crash. And same with like out of array indexing, null pointer issues. Uh, users don't usually cause this uh, because they don't have access to uh, null pointers. And if you input to index into that's still kind of on you, even though it's the user that made the mistake. So, but uh, users can definitely trigger this as well in some cases, I would say. For example, if they have a computer with two megabytes of memory, uh, users will trigger out of memory errors a lot, but then they probably wouldn't have a computer in the first place. So there's that. Uh, then we have some examples of recoverable errors. Uh, for example, opening a file that does not exist. Um, this can simply produce a, the file doesn't exist. Um, which depending on your program, some of these could be unrecoverable. For example, if your program relies on a configuration file that must exist to work, you could say that in, your, in the case of your program, it will simply crash if it does not exist. There is no way out or you just don't want to handle it. So you say that in the, kit, in the context of your program, this is, uh, you can't recover from this. Uh, but uh, that's, very context specific. So in general, if there's a way out in the where you can handle the error, um, let's assume you, you do so, and then you can recover. So parsing a JSON file, if there's invalid input, this could cause, uh, you could basically just get an error message that the JSON file is not formatted properly. You can edit the file, you can try again, and then the program will, uh, succeed so or if you want to read user input in an expected format but the user screws up uh, they forget a capital letter they don't type an age that's valid so if you think about the student example that uh, marius has been running and accepting uh, various uh, submissions for in different languages uh, it's a pretty much uh, a case for recoverable errors and plenty of them since uh, you can fail on the first name, the last name, you can fail on the age. There are many different cases of failure and all of these can, uh, obviously just writing the wrong name or uh, the, the wrong format can, will not, should not crash your program. That is not, at least not a good user experience. Um, so, and in Rust, uh, a recoverable error is often more likely to be caused by a user, for example, this is where a user can say, open this file and print it to the screen and the file doesn't exist and it's the user that did it, but your program is nice and chooses to handle the error saying what's wrong, what caused it, and maybe giving them a chance to re-enter their inputs. Um, you could also just crash and panic here, but then the user would not be wiser. They wouldn't necessarily know how to read uh, the stack trace. Uh, or a panic message, they would just think your program is very unstable and not very user-friendly and maybe move on and use something else. So this goes for uh, many cases, like it could be web apps, it could be mobile apps, uh, or just terminal applications too. Um, you want to handle errors like this in an elegant way. So users of your program are able to uh, more easily interact with it, understand what's wrong, and then uh, use that uh, information to start using your program correctly so it less errors happen uh, in the case of recoverable errors they also force you to think about error cases and what can be done to avoid them or to deal with them for example with user inputs uh, maybe you want to give the user another chance maybe you want to uh, 
not do so, uh, maybe you want to give them a hint that, hey, you're almost there. Uh, or maybe you just expect the users to read the manual and say, please refer to the manual for how to use this. Uh, and so, yeah. So in Rust, the recoverable errors, um, the, the general way is to use the result type, which uh, is generic on two types. That's T, which is the success type. So where you would, would normally, for example, if a user is supposed to enter a number, you would return uh, like an integer. Uh, you would put I32, for example, as the result success type, which is what you would normally return if you didn't use the result type. And the error type um, is the type of error that can happen in case of failure. So this could be like an IO error in case of user input. Uh, it could just be the error type itself. Or it could be any type that implements std error, which is a, a trait. So we won't look exactly at implementing our own error types for for the default result type today. But uh, once we get into traits and generics as well, we can sort of loop back and in include this stuff. But the, 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 the important part is that T is the success type and E is the error type. And usually you find the error type based on the kind of functions that you call. So we're gonna do that when we look at an example. Uh, so, Let's quickly look at using result and then dive into some code. Let's look at the chat as well. Okay. So a uh, result is a type. Uh, it's an enum in Rust uh, that defines a success and an error type. And it represents something that can fail. Uh, and uh, it says basically that you should care about this and handle it as a program. If you return it from a function, uh, then it puts responsibility on the caller to handle it if, it's, uh, uh, if that's what they want. Or they can ignore it and just uh, use some of the functions we looked at earlier, like unwrap and expect to say that uh, we, don't, we just care about the success, otherwise just crash the program. That's usually what you can start doing when you just prototype a program. You just unwrap everything and then once you know the prototype is working, you can start handling the error cases and make a better user experience. And sometimes uh, returning a result from a function is often better than deciding yourself how to handle error in the function, especially if you write code that others will be using because uh, your way of handling the error might not be the way they would prefer it in their application. So a basic uh, example is when you open a file, for example, the cargo.toml file, uh, you can handle the result case and either it's okay, so it's a success and you get to read the file, or it's an error and you get an error in return. And in this case, we just return the error to the caller. But we will look at some code now to use. Uh, we will use panic, we will use unwrap, we will use expect just to cover the unrecoverable part. And then we will... Uh, look at the, the result type as well for opening a file and look, trying to provoke some errors. Let's just read it. There we go. Uh, so is that if the text is uh, big enough, that's, uh, I hope so. If not, I will make it bigger. So let's start with, uh, we, we can use our file example. So let's um, start by just making a function read the file. And then we will just make a constant uh, file to read. And we will read cargo.toml. So let's basically use this code right here to begin with, uh, but uh, without. Um, so let's create a mutable variable f that will be our file. And we will use standard libraries file system file. That's the type we want to use for this. So we want to go file, open, and we want to open the file to read. 
and it's mutable because if you want to read the file, we need to be able to uh, mutate the, where we are in the file. And we see right now that it's returning a result with file. So uh, basically we know that if it's a result, this code can fail. Uh, there are many ways for it to fail. We will try to uh, discover some of them. Um, so, uh, but we don't know that. We have to check it in our code. So let's just call read the file here real quick and see what happens with, with what we have right now. So we will go cargo run. And since we have many binaries, like we discussed last week in packaging, uh, I have some prepared demos as well. Uh, we will try to run live demo. And uh, yeah, we get some warnings because it doesn't need to be mutable yet, but uh, at least it doesn't crash. Uh, we could also try to make it a file that does not exist and it still doesn't crash. Um, so that might be interesting to you. But uh, uh, the reason we don't do anything is because of course we get a result. So this is a recoverable error. And since we don't actually use it for anything, uh, basically the program doesn't care if it succeeds or fails since, um, since we just try to open it, but we don't actually care what the result of that is. We'd never use it. So the program won't care at all. So let's try to call unwrap on this. So this is the way of triggering an unrecoverable error. So this either returns the file. So we see now this the return type change from result file to just file. So, which means if this succeeds, we get the file. Otherwise it panics, so it crashes the program. So if you run it now, it still runs fine. But if we change it to something that does not exist, uh, we get a panic. So thread main panicked where it called result on wrap on an error value. So it was an error and the error is code two, not found, no such file or directory. So now we get a simple backtrace that says what's wrong. But uh, uh, this is definitely not the most readable message. And we also hard crashed our program when we just wanted to open a file. Uh, so let's not do that. But uh, let's just quickly use accept expect as well, where you can basically include an error message. So fail to open that file, which basically means instead of instead of that, we also get panicked at fail to open the file. So instead of called result and wrap, we actually get fail to open the file. So we get a little bit of a context message, but it's still pretty ugly to look at the error message. So, uh, so that's basically how you use those two methods to produce unrecoverable errors or where you, you can also use these guys if you know for sure that this can never fail. Like, you know, there's never going to be an error case. So you just use them because you know, there's not going to be an error case and this is much faster to just get the file. So for example, if you know that this file will forever exist, uh, it will never go anywhere. It will always be there. You can use this in your code, but if there's a chance that it doesn't, then this will crash your program if it, if it fails. So keep that in mind. Uh, so yeah, let's just read the file as well. So we want a text, a buffer, so it's a new string to be a buffer where we can read the file to. And then we only wanna go file, read to string, and we wanna read it to uh, the buffer. So this can also fail. Uh, we see that this returns a result. And it even says it in the, in the documentation that uh, if it's successful, it returns the number of bytes that were read. Uh, and if it's not, then the buffer is unchanged. So we don't modify the string and we get an error result. So, uh, so here as well, we can use those methods, but let's not do that for now. And that right now we want to actually handle, deal with the errors. And at this point, it's time for us to say, we don't, we should not handle this error ourselves, but we want uh, whoever calls. So in this case, the main function to uh, choose what to do. So we're gonna change the return type of the function to the result. And the result we want is 
reading the files. So the success type of this function is a string. So if we succeed, we read the file and we return the string. Uh, but we also need to specify the error type. Like we could maybe just be generic and say that, say we want to use an error, any error. But uh, uh, we, you see, we get a warning since uh, this is technically then a trait object and we need to put the din keyword in front, but but we are not going to discuss trait objects today. So let's actually try to figure out how to do this uh, properly for this particular function. So we know that file open returns an error. So let's go into the, that one and just take a look at the type of error it returns. So, um, so it will produce an error and uh, here we can see that it produces std io result. So maybe it uses an io error. In fact, uh, it does. So let's just use that error type, std io error. So if it uses an io result, then it probably also uses an io error. And the io result is just, uh, it's just the result that comes with this value already filled in. So if you wanted to, we could go std io result and just do this. And then we say, this comes pre-filled in with the error type. So we don't have to specify it. But for now, let's specify it just so we know that this is an IO error. Um, and let's uh, work on this uh, F a little bit because now it's a result, we want to handle it. So let's do a match case on the file open. and add the patterns. So we have an OK case and an error case. And in the OK case, we get a file. And in the error case, we get an error. So in the case where we get a file, we just want to pass on the file. So now we're assigning the variable to the result of the match expression. And if we are OK, we get a file. Otherwise, we might want to return just to return the error. But uh, it's expecting a result, so we can't actually return the error itself. Uh, so if we look here, we can actually see what we need to do. Uh, a result is an enum. So we have to re return not the type of the enum, but one of the enum values. And in the case of result, that's either OK or error. So we have to wrap the error in the error case of the enum. Uh, so now basically we say, Either we get the file or we just return the error to whoever called the function and they can figure out what they want to do with it. Um, we're going to do the same thing here. Just we're going to use a slightly different syntax just to show that you can do it multiple ways. So if you read to the string, we want to say uh, if let OK uh, bytes, it returns the number of bytes. Yeah, this considers it's a return value. So just to make it not complain, we're going to do this. So if let is another special kind of syntax. I don't know if you discussed this already, uh, Marius. Maybe you did it when you looked at the match uh, statement, in which case I won't go into detail. Yeah, we, we mentioned that, that you can do a pattern on the left-hand side and yep. then um, a variable on the right, and you can do uh, not uh, complete pattern matching with the if let. Uh, yeah. Construct, yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we're going to use that here because if you only care about the success case, then maybe you can do this. So we read to a string, and then we can say something like we read bytes. Um, but maybe we also care about the error case. So in this case, let's add an else to it and say in that case we want to return error. Um, we can create our own error or just instantiate our own. Since what we lose here is we lose uh, we lose the error case. So since this is can obviously be used with enums that have multiple uh, values, not just OK and error. So uh, here we have to actually specify something. So that's uh, this is not necessarily how you would do it because. Uh, 
as you can see, you lose the error data. So instead we have to file specify our own. So for example, we can say, we can just say uh, an expected end of file or something. We just make something up here and we say, um, this uh, did not work. So now uh, we actually see that we read 307 bytes from cargo.tomo, uh, but we also want to return, in the case we get here, we want to say that, okay, the function was okay. So we actually got out and we're going to return our buffer where we read into. So, and in the error case, it just says that this did not work. So in main, we now want to, we know now call this function that returns the result. Uh, and in both error cases, we return the, the result instead. And we want main to handle the error case. Since this function should not decide what the caller needs in case of error handling. So here we want to just say, uh, we can do the match thing. We can do unwrap or expect, uh, or we can use another one of these functions. We can use uh, a help function that is basically uh, unwrap or, or else, uh, unwrap or, which produces a default value in the case of failure. So this is another way of error handling that does not cause panics. So unwrap panics in the case of an error. Uh, unwrap or else calls a callback function in the case of a failure. Unwrap or provides a default value in case of failure. Uh, but in our case, we're going to make just do a simple case and say, I'm going to match read the file. And in the OK, we're going to say, this is our text. And we're going to just print line we read and the text. And in the error case, we're going to simply go uh, print line on the standard error output instead of this just standard output and say error and print the error instead. So now when we're in the program, we just get uh, everything is cool. Um, we get uh, uh, the cargo.toml file. Um, let's try to make this an error. So we change the file name to something that does not exist. Now I just get error, OS code two, kind not found, no search file or directory. So this is a lot easier to look at than the stack traces we got before, like this huge panic thing. It's a bit harder to identify the error here. So printing it out manually instead of crashing the program and allows you to produce more readable error messages. So you could also be even more, it could be more specific here and try to depending on the error type, because now we're just doing it on the generic trait. So we could try to format this even more pleasantly if you wanted to. Uh, but the doing that in all cases is going to be a bit tedious. So that's why later we're going to look at another way of formatting errors that are going to be very beautiful to look at. Um, yeah, so that's just uh, basic usage of results. Let's hop back to the slides unless there are any questions. Okay. Uh, so let's look at the question mark operator. Um, like we're doing now when we're propagating error cases to the, to the caller of the function, uh, we see that we have multiple opportunities of error in the function where we open the file and we read the file. And it can cause a little bit of messy code when returning the error result many places. So for example, here we have a match case here and we have match case here. And all it does is just say, hey, either if we get an error, we return it. Otherwise, we don't care and we move on with the function. Uh, and that gets a bit messy sometimes. So we have a, a question mark operator that basically does this for you. And it's a lot cleaner to read, avoids uh, handling manual error cases where you just want to propagate the error to the caller. And if you don't want to do that, then you should still handle it locally, of course. So in the main function, we might want to handle it locally, whereas here we can use the question mark operator. Uh, so let's do that 
here. Let's change this to use the question mark. Uh, so the way we do that is we get rid of the entire match statement and put the question mark at the end. So this does the same. So this thing basically is handled by doing this. So what it does is it you use it after a result. So if this is a this value is the result, which it does result file. If you put the question mark here, it it means you are, you just get the return value, or you return the result. So the type of the result has to match basically. And we can do the same thing here when we read to string. And we can say let bytes equals that. Looks like I forgot something. Right, if let, yeah. There we go. And uh, now it does the same thing, but it's a lot more readable. So we, we strip away all the unnecessary error handling, and we actually just get the code that we care about. At this point, we don't even have to assign the value since we just want to read it and return the error. We don't really care about the number of bytes. And now we get the no such file or directory, and it's a lot cleaner. So we just get this. Uh, we can also provoke another type of error. If we just go to, uh, for example, I think I prepared this. Uh, no, but if we go to this one, we should not have access, but we do have access. Yeah. Well, if you have a file that you don't have read access to, you can provoke a no access error as well. So yeah, that's the question mark operator. Uh, and now let's uh, move on to uh, another example. So uh, all of these examples that I'm doing live now, you can find them in the repository once I push the code, uh, just they are named basically, like read some file basically does what we just did with if let, uh, question mark does what we did with the question mark operator. Uh, so now let's move on to anyhow basics. So in Cario, to use anyhow, you just have to add it to your dependencies by typing anyhow, and you take the latest version, for example, uh, and then you can access it. So uh, what that does, uh, this is a library that provides anyhow error, which is a trait object based error type for idiomatic error handling in Rust. So that's uh, sounds cool, but uh, what does it mean in practice? Uh, it provides a generic error type that works for anything that implements stud error. So if you remember before, uh, in this uh, function where we're using result, we have to specify result, string, and the error type. Uh, by using anyhow, you don't have to specify the error type because it becomes generic. So it, anything that Im has implements the error traits uh, will work. So you can have multiple types of errors, you can mix and match, and you don't have to specify it in the, in the return type. So that saves you a lot of figuring out the type of error. It allows you to work with uh, errors a lot more flexibly and focus on the return type, which is, which is what you actually care about. Uh, you can also specify the error type if you absolutely want to, but uh, that's, not, that's not that's just part of the point anyway. Uh, secondly, uh, it means, yeah, you can add, add error contexts for easier user and developer debugging. So when errors happen, you can add some context to them, which produces extremely readable and neat error messages. So it's very easy to, for users and developers to figure out what's going wrong. And it's a lot just on general, a lot more intuitive to use results, which would encourage courage, better error handling and actually using result and, uh, and, uh, uh, the recoverable error handling just a lot more because it becomes a, such it becomes less painful to use it and then it's more fun to use it and then your program becomes better because of those things because you actually care about handling your errors so let's take this read file and just change it around a little bit so as a user now uh, if we run this code 
it works. And if we take a file that does not exist, we get a more readable error, but it's not necessarily the best. So it's like no such file in directory, okay. Uh, so I already added anyhow, so let's start using it. So the only thing you need to do is use anyhow result. And now you are ready to go. So what we want to do is replace the return type with the result. And now we just have to say that the string is what we can get out of it. Uh, so basically this is a very thin wrapper on top of the default result type of Rust. So you could also, if you don't want to use anyhow result, you could use the default result, result type and instead specify here that you want to get that bits and anyhow error. And that's sort of the same thing if you want to do uh, keep the original result type. But the anyhow one is super thin wrapper and it works exactly the same like the other one. So, uh, and it's very nice to use it. So, so let's just do it, do it that way. Say we want the string. Uh, apart from that, the code basically works the same. Uh, except we look at our error message already. Um, before it looked like, oh, where is it? Oh, let's just do it from the program again. So basically now the error loses a lot of the boilerplate. So we go straight to no such file directory. So that's already more readable. So we get already more uh, readable formatting of errors without any extra details. Uh, however, uh, we can do even more. As I, as I mentioned, we can add a context to errors. So right now it just says no file or directory, but we have no idea what, what that means. So we can add a context to opening of the file. And this, so if we just type dot context on the result type, we can say opening file, and then we can add the file name, so file to read. And if we run the program again, we get error opening the file blah, 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 and it's caused by no such file or directory. So by adding the context, we get our error in the context and we get what it's caused by, which is the error produced by the result. And suddenly it's like, it's very nice formatting. It's very clear both the developer and the user that you try to open this file and it, that's an error because, because of there is no such file or directory. So at this point, you should, if you're a user and you typed in this string, you will notice that, oh shit, I, I, I just typed it wrong. And then you run it correctly and you get the good result. At this point, uh, another thing we can do is that uh, the anyhow result type can be reused as a return type from main. So we can also here say, mm, we can just say read the file here directly. Uh, right, because this returns a string. So that uh, text equals this guy. And then if we get the text, we print the text. Uh, and then we have to say, okay, at the bottom. And that's never used, right. Yeah, so now we get the, the same thing. Mm, the only difference now is if, so this is nice for maybe like a terminal or a command line application, where uh, if, you, if you parse some arguments here and then something did not work out, uh, you can just return the result directly from main, which means uh, if we fuck it up again, uh, whoops, uh, we get we just get the error directly from main. It just prints it as it exits. So if we try to use a command line application like this and use some arguments, we just get uh, this error straight away. And this could be many different errors. So let's move on to. Uh, a little bit more. So this is how, as I showed here, uh, you can add a context. And there are two ways of doing it. Uh, we just call some function that returns a result and add a context. And then we, you can use the question mark afterwards or not. 
Uh, the other way is to call with context, which is uh, where you pass a lambda function. Uh, that and that one is lazily evaluated only in the case of an error. So in this case, you add the string anyway. And this is a function that you can call that basically should return a string, uh, but it's only called if there's an error. So if you want to lazily evaluate the error, then you can use that one instead. Uh, so if now just to try this out, uh, we're gonna, if you guys want to, you can, uh, create a small project, just go cargo new testing uh, and just try to define a function that generates a random integer. And if it's not above a certain values, for example, one to 10, and if it's not above five, then make the function panic. So just to try to use the panic. Oh, and I think I forgot to show that if you want your program to panic, you can use the panic macro to directly, I just crash here. And the program will crash here with that message. So that's how you manually trigger a panic. But uh, I will give you a five minute break so you can either try to do this or just take, you know, go to the bathroom or drink some water. Oh, and to generate a random number, I don't know if you've done it yet, but under dependencies, you can add a rand. So you can add this to the dependencies. And then you can just go create a mutable RNG and make it do this. And then you can go rng.generate range, for example, 0 to 10. So if you use those two lines and what I pasted there, you can generate and make it a function that panics if it's like less than five.
going to wait uh, about one more minute. Um, I know it's not a lot of time, but at least you would have had some time to think about the problem. Okay, so whether you did this or not, doesn't matter. I hope you at least tried. If anyone wants to, they can paste their code in the chat if they want to just post an example. Uh, if not, let's look at uh, one way to do this. Uh, so in this case, we want to panic on failures. So the function just returns the int i32. So, and we create the random number like I showed you before. And if x is greater than five, uh, we return x. Otherwise we just straight off panic and say, say that the number is out of range. Uh, so that's where we don't do error handling and we just straight up want to say this is unrecoverable. We can't possibly generate the random number below, uh, below six in this case. So if we just run it, uh, let's run random functions. Uh, now we get a panic because the number's out of range. We run it again, uh, it succeeds. Let's actually print it. So now our program randomly crashes. So we got nine, we got seven, we got nine, we got a crash, we got a crash, we got a crash, we got eight. So that's just a way to, uh, like, instead of creating some imaginary case where the user tries to fail to crash, we just randomly do it to test it. Uh, I technically have another task uh, where you generate a result and handle it with a match case. Where it fails, it should try the function again until it succeeds, so basically repeat until success. And if it succeeds, it should print the generated number. So uh, if you're already in a project you can try to add this as well and we're going to do the same thing with the random number so if uh, if it's greater than five we fail except now we want to return a result and we want to handle it in a loop by saying if it fails try again uh, if it succeeds just uh, use the value and move on so i will give you until 9 30 to do that and then we're going to wrap up afterwards with a more complete example where we do some user input and error handling and we can finish up with some questions in the end. So uh, I'll leave this open and you can and post the previous one. And post this code here, just so you can use it as reference. And now we want to use, uh, do the other task. So I'll leave the task open and give you five minutes to think about it. I will pause the recording for until 9.30. Yeah. Okay, so if anyone wants to post uh, some code in the chat, they are free to do so. If not, we will just look at uh, a one possible solution. So there are definitely more solutions that you can do, uh, but for now, let's look at this one. Uh, so result fail is basically the same thing. We generate a number, uh, we let X be in a range. And if it's greater than five, we say, okay, and return X. Otherwise we set say, an error. And here we use another feature of anyhow, where we produce an error on the fly that is formatted. So we say the number is out of range, the error, and the context is that uh, we produce, we had invalid inputs, except it's not input, it's just random numbers, but it 
could have could as well have been inputs. Uh, so this result re returns a result of I32. And then we have a repeat until success that base that loops and says uh, we match and result fail. If it's okay, we print the number and then break the loop. In any other case, we just print the error and say that we're retrying due to that error. Uh, and that way we break the loop once the function succeeds. So if we want to do, we could probably make this uh, take like a lambda or some other anonymous function that uh, um, uh, is a function that returns the result. And then we can call this for any, uh, any function that we wanted to. If we wanted to make it generic, we could repeat any result error function until it succeeds. Uh, of course, that's going to be a bit stupid to do if, uh, if we're going to call it on something like opening a file that does not exist, then it's going to just spin forever until the, you create that file. So in some cases, you don't want to do it. But for maybe something like user IO, uh, it's not that bad. So if we try to run it, we see that we get, first we got eight from our panic function. Then it says, uh, we're trying due to error in valid input caused by the number being out of range. And then we repeat that until we got six, which is about five. So that's the last slide, but let's uh, take a look at one more example, which is gonna be a, uh, be about user input. So. Here, I'm going to just have the code prepared and just walk through it. Um, so we have a function called read integer in range. Uh, it takes a range, an inclusive range of integers, and it returns a result that uh, should be an integer in the case of success. So here, we basically want to limit uh, the input that the user can uh, input uh, into this range. So we just prompt the user for a range, enter a number in the range, and then we create a buffer, a string buffer, where we can read into. And then we use a standard input to read a line into the buffer. And this returns a result because it could fail to read the line uh, for whatever reason. Like it could be end of file, maybe something else. And we add a context there with anyhow to say reading input, that's the context. So in this case, if we fail to read some input, we would get like the context is that there's an error reading the input, and then we would get the cause. And we use a question mark operator here uh, to propagate this error to the result in case this one fails. So we could also be out of memory. If uh, we are out of memory and the string, there's no room for the string, if this input is huge, like if it's 10 gigabytes of input and you only have eight gigs of memory, then that it would fail. Uh, then we use uh, try to create a number. So we do a similar thing. We trim the buffer so we get rid of new lines, spaces, and everything at the beginning and end of the string. So this basically gets us a string slice to the trimmed version of the slice. It doesn't mutate the string. Uh, then we call that parse to parse it as a integer so this produces a result uh, of an integer or a parse int error and then we pass a context again so parsing the user input number so if we don't type a number that's going to be the error and the error context and we're going to use the question mark uh, to get the error to the caller or otherwise uh, just uh, move on so then we get the integer and then finally we're going to manually use um, if, range, if the range contains uh, this number, so if our input range contains the number, then we say, okay, so this is an okay result and we return a number. Otherwise, oh, let's just do this for now. We produce an error that says uh, not uh, a valid number or numbers out of range. I'm gonna put what was there back after we go and look at this one. And then in the main, we just said the birth here is read integer in range 1900 to 2021 with a question mark since the main function here returns the result as well. And then we say print birth year and we print the birth year. So if we just try to run it. We get enter number in this range 
I can write 1500 and it says number of number cell range. I can type lots of letters and it says a parsing error parsing the user input number caused by invalid digit in strings. So clearly these guys are not digits. We can add spaces and write 919. And uh, this is out of range, which is this. Or we can add spaces and write 90. And uh, then it works because it strips the white space. Uh, so this uh, illustrates uh, basically where we get to use both the question mark operator and manually check creating OKs and errors. And otherwise, we just want to use the value and print an error to the user if they fail. So. Uh, but however, uh, there is one more thing to consider. Sometimes just typing out uh, errors like this, it's not necessarily uh, the best way of doing it because uh, you have, you know, if you have a, no a known predetermined set of errors that can happen, you might want to create an enum for it, like an integer range error in case of reading the integer in range, uh, where we can create. So normally you have to derive something from this error trait, but by using this error, uh, we get a derived macro, so we can automatically derive from the error trait. Uh, and in this case, we can just create an enum with all the cases and annotate each enum with the error macro. So, so we have out of range, which takes two parameters, the input number and the range. And then the error becomes number then the input out of range, expected range is range. So then we can use the, uh, the data that we supply in the enum to create the error string. And later we can then switch, we can match on this particular error case to say, if we want to handle this error case differently from another error, then we can, <clears throat> then we can match on that. So if we had out of range, we also had, uh, it, it just failed. And we can say, had an error case this as well. Uh, it just failed. That's it. So if if we get this error message, then it, then we could get this text. So, and how we use that is instead of inside of this anyhow macro, you basically just instead create your enum. So int error, error range error out of range, and then you say the input is the number and the range is the range. And then in the case of error where we write 2500, we get a uh, number 2500 is out of range, expected range is 1900 to 2021. And then we get the formatting by just supplying the parameters of the error. So this is much nicer for people to use in that the error message will be consistent for this error and you pass in the parameters needed to produce a sensible error message. Uh, but let's say we also want to say it just failed. So before we check for range, we're going to add, uh, let's just RNG equals the random thread RNG. And then we're gonna go, uh, uh, there's a function here for, uh, oh, I don't remember what it's called. I think it's something. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, let's just do zero to a hundred. If uh, this one is greater than 50, so at 50, 50, basically, let's uh, go ahead and say error, in range error, it just failed. So now I can say in 50% of the cases, it will just fail. Uh, did I fail? I failed actually to do a return. So now I can enter a number. And sometimes it just fails, that's it. However, what we want to do with this is instead of doing the question mark here, we want to be able to do uh, something else to the result type. So.
So let's just sign it like this. So now we get the result. So we match it. In the OK case, we're going to print the year. And then in the error case, uh, error four. we can also match further on the error. And uh, by doing so, we can basically treat different errors differently. So uh, let's take a look at that. So, um, where we have our error, we can say uh, actually this, this is uh, an anyhow error. So we can use a downcast ref. So where we get an option. So we can say if we if this is a int range error. So if the error, if let's uh, int range or actually match this and we want to do, so here we get an option. So an option we can also unwrap. So in this case, let's, let's just unwrap it so we can do the case. So now we can match. So in the case that we downcast the error to an int range error, so that's our error type. Uh, we just unwrap it here so we don't have to handle the, uh, the the case where it's not, just to show the concept. So we have out of range, which has two parameters. So input like so. So now we can just say, we can deal with the error differently depending on the type. So uh, here we could also do like, in case it's another error. So this can also be, uh, like a read IO error or a parsed error. Uh, so we can say in the case it's a parsed error, we want to do something else. In the case it's an int range error, we can do something like this. So it, it just failed, we can just print, for example, additionally. Well, that is not fun. And in case it's out of range, we could also decide to do some else, something else here. So the out of range is caused by your this is just to get something printed. Like in a real case, you might want to actually have something else happen here. So if we now do 20,000, uh, we now get the out of range is caused by your input being invalid. So here we actually don't print the error that we get. So we can also do that. By adding the error. So, so do the semicolons. Oh, now it just failed, so that's not fun. Let's just fail again. Now I got the panic uh, because the yeah, it wasn't an intrange area this time. Uh, yeah, so this actually just fails way too much. Yeah, there we go. So now we get the out of range is caused by our input being valid. And then we print the error, which is number 899 out of range. Uh, so basically with anyhow, you can use downcast ref to get the error types. Uh, if you didn't use that, then there is error.kind, except now anyhow it sort of overrides that since this is an anyhow error type. Uh, for regular errors, you could match on the kind of error. Uh, and uh, the nice thing about this one is that uh, it returns an option. So it's it's also safe to cast it to errors of your own type. Uh, but if so, if you just go back to any of the other things, you can just quickly look at matching the other error kind. So using result, we get a result here. Um, we read some file, which is result. 
let's use smart share. No, it's yeah, let's use smart share. So let's just change this quickly. So if you go uh, match text, uh, let's ignore the success case. Uh, error is the error case. We just gotta go okay. Uh, so here we can go. There is something called error dot kind. So we can match further on the error kind. So uh, yeah. So here are all the kinds of errors that we can care about. Uh, in our case, we are reading a file. So let's say we only care about, uh, is there a not found? So let's say we only care about that one. So we got underscore for the rest. And for not found, we will say, uh, for example, the file does not exist. Try creating it or check for typos. So if we now change this file, uh, we get this message in the case of uh, not found. And if we made some other error happen, uh, we can just Let's try to read invalid. And then uh, it does not exist. It should exist. It actually understands this. Oh, it's .txt. Actually, let's do the full path. Yeah, then we, in this case, we don't get an error message because the error kind is something else. So we can actually say, uh, let's say if we find permission denied is the other one. So print line, uh, you don't have access to this. And then you get that. So so this is, the, this is the way it would just match on regular errors if you want to handle different kinds of errors differently. So you can match on the kind or with anyhow, you can use the don't downcasting uh, with the downcast ref. But if you don't do that, then it will just print the message directly. So unless there are questions, I think that uh, should be enough error handling to at least get you started. And if you want to use any or not, that's optional, but uh, it does add a lot of features that this makes error handling uh, more fun and easy to manage. So uh, I suggest using it if you want to. Uh, if you don't, then uh, it's not that much more work to do it the normal way. How, how popular is the Anyhow library? Like how often For, people use it? From what I know, people who start using it never stop using it and keep using it in every project. Mm -hmm. So I think it's uh, fairly popular in that case. Let's, I don't know if there are download. Uh, yeah, if, if we go to just create.io, uh, there should be a list of the most popular ones. I think it's pretty high up. I think that's where I found it. Uh, Yeah, so 9 million downloads, so it's pretty popular. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty out there. And this error, yeah. also 9. Yeah, so because Almost they 10. often use together yeah. to just get those errors, so you don't, uh, get the derived macro for error. So in the derived macro, um, there was a, a syntax for obtaining the values for the actual, uh, yeah, this one. Yeah. This is um specific for the this error itself or is it more like um used in other use cases as well 
Uh, what do you mean? So yeah, like the 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 um, the syntax to obtain the value out of the oh, like this the, one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's part of the form. It generates probably like a format string out of this, and I you know it can have named arg arguments in regular format strings as well. So if we go hello uh, name and age, I think you can go. There is something like you can have named part uh, per arguments in regular format strings. I just don't remember the syntax. Okay, all right. So I think it the macro just generates the code for that. Yeah, just for the name this one. name formatting. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. Probably is the syntax for it. Yeah, there it is. So it is actually like that. Yeah, with the equality. Form. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so that's uh, that's what it does internally, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, have you used? Uh, have you defined any macros yourself? I was kind of looking into that, but it is yeah, but scary? nothing, nothing advanced. Just uh, trying to dabble with the syntax, which is quite uh, abstract compared to regular Rust. Yeah. But it is extremely powerful. Like you yeah, yeah. can basically do a lot of rewrite things in site, and then you basically generate your Rust uh, out of it. Um, yeah. So pretty much a small meta programming uh, framework. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. And it's right. better, better than C uh, and C plus plus macros, since you can actually scope them and uh, import them, and they actually get checked by the compiler. Mm -hmm. So you have a little bit more safety there. Yeah. And you can also use cargo expand uh, to see what the macros produce. But uh, let's see. I don't know if it's. Uh... So we can see what print plan creates if we, I don't know if I get access to it in the context menu. But uh, I know in Visual Studio Code, at least, I think you can right click and get uh, the expansion. OK. So you can see what the code of the macro produces. But I'm pretty sure this is the command. Oh, yeah, I forgot to say, probably anyhow. Four. Yeah, so there you get, then you get the so for our error type, this is what the macro produces. So mm -hmm. there's the arguments that it creates based on input and range. And this also expands the format macro and the print line macro. So every macro becomes, so this is the print line, I think, that is here. It gets expanded to IO print with the arguments all of that. So mm -hmm. essentially, if you didn't use the macro, this is what you would have to write instead. So be thankful of the macro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, if you want to look at the macros, that's cargo expand. Yeah, that's cool. So, all right, yeah. great. Any questions, guys? Doesn't seem. If you think about anything later, you can just ask in the Discord or something like that, or on the issue tracker. Yeah, so I was, um, we had a discussion with one of the students in terms of how often do you define your own error types and how you piggyback uh, on the existing ones. So, for example, for IO, for IO error, you can basically have uh, a, a, a catch all IO error, which is basically backed up by string. So you can sort of uh, generate your own uh, IO errors. And then in your functions, you can sort of always fall back to the IO error such that you can use a question mark everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. Or, yeah, in case that you actually uh, caught something, then you can generate this string based error. So yeah. it is, but with anyhow, it's sort of uh, yeah superseded because you can sort of do that with the anyhow library anyway. Yeah. Uh, 
So we were wondering, yeah, how often do you actually generate your own errors or how often yeah, you piggyback on the existing framework for error handling? But I guess it depends on the use case. Uh, Probably it will do that. So yeah, I mean, if your errors match the existing ones, then you might as well use them. But uh, for specific, like application-specific logic, then I, I think it would make sense to create your own types or at least uh, uh, because then uh, even if it kind of matches the standard library, it's going to be used in an application-specific domain. And then uh, it makes sense to have your own type so you can use it for testing and uh, you have control of the type. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as you showed, you can basically match on the type uh, later on and do some yep. more uh, complex logic if you have the type information. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah, and Golang gets a bit messy at the moment because you have to sort of match on the strings which the errors have, and that is messy. Uh, yeah, so yeah. that's why it's nice to use the enum for this as well. Yeah, exactly. Because you know you have, uh, there can't be any more values than just these deep predefined enum values. Yeah, that's true. And also, like if you are uh, using enums, you can enforce, if you don't use the underscore, you can enforce that you've checked all the types or all the errors that you actually thought of. Um, yeah. So that also added bonus if you want that. Um, sometimes you don't. Um, and then you can use the underscore to match all. Yeah. Yeah. But at least you can check uh, yeah, what what is enforced by the compiler. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Uh, that sounds good. So we can wrap it up. Uh, thanks a lot. And I will, um, yeah, I will stop. Uh, so just one more question up here. Uh, you can use error enums without any how as well. So the standard IO uh, enum is uh, like we saw in here. Uh, so this error kind is also, if we go and look at it, is an enum as well from the standard library. And same with the uh, uh, the IO error is actually a struct, though, but it implements, uh, it's defined by the kind, which is we see here. Yeah, you stop sharing the screen. Oh, right. Yeah, well, uh, so anyway, the, the error kind that's used by the IO error is also an enum. So. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know about the anyhow library, so I haven't used it, but I've used the enums for the, um, yeah, to, uh, just build in error handling. And yeah. it works quite well as well. So, so pretty much anything you do with anyhow, you can do without it as well. It just adds a bit of utility on top of the defaults. And it's, uh, uh, at least for me, I feel like the error handling became a lot more fun to do, which I think yeah, forced me to do more of it because I enjoyed it more. Mm -hmm. And I think the con the context adds kind of a lot of value. Um, yeah, so, so I, that's, I... that's actually my favorite feature about it, so. yeah. I agree. So I, I like the con con concept of a context and then having an error in a context of what you were doing and that gives you a lot of information. Uh, so yeah. with the normal error handling, you kind of, you don't have it uh, out of the box. You, so you, you know, you have to encode it in the errors that you're dealing with, so. Yeah, and especially if you have like deep nested chains of functions returning result, you can sort of chain the context on top of each other. So you can actually look at a bit very uh, nice context tree. Yeah. If you call a function that returns a result from a function that returns a result that each of them adds context to the error, then mm -hmm. you can get the pretty nice uh, and easy to debug error message. Yeah. But yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Um, so we'll see you guys on Tuesday. And then on Tuesday, we will have an extra session afterwards. Uh, so that, has, that will be advertised. Um, yeah, all right. Thanks.